again, I'm John Willie from Emory. Um, it looks like it's going to cut off a little bit. I apologize for that. Um, it looks like it's going to cut off significantly, but we'll see if that's a problem. So my disclosures, I've been a consultant for Monteris and Visualase, two companies that make uh, laser interstitial therapy, therapy probes, and also uh, work with MRI interventions, which is uh, one of the stereotactic uh, devices that we use to deliver these probes, and, and uh, they're here today. You can see their uh, devices as well. Um, oh, and one other thing is that even though I'm mostly talking about laser interstitial therapy for epilepsy, that's not necessarily an FDA-approved indication. Uh, use of these probes is indicated for any ablation of neural tissues, including brain, but there's no specific indication such as epilepsy or tumor. That's better? Great, thanks. So as you all know, temporal lobe epilepsy uh, uh, te temporal lobe surgery is effective. In fact, it's something that we actually have class one data for. Uh, the only prospective randomized clinical trial uh, is that of anterior temporal lobe uh, lobectomy and amygdala hippocampectomy in patients with, uh, with mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. This study from, uh, from 2001 uh, shows that with this aggressive, by uh, today's standards, aggressive uh, uh, resection of the anterior temporal lobe, you, you achieve 64% seizure freedom at one year. Um, there's questions of how these patients are selected. Probably most of these patients were, were mesial temporal sclerosis patients. As we'll get into later, there's, there's patients without mesial temporal sclerosis, and their outcomes may not be as good as this. Um, but definitely compared to medical management alone, uh, in which long-term seizure freedom is more like 8%, in a surgical group that's 64% at a year uh, in the intention to treat, uh, and 58% overall, this is a highly effective therapy. So you're a bunch of surgeons, I don't have to convince you that epilepsy surgery is good. But um, in addition to temporal lobe surgery, this has also been shown to be very effective for cortical resections of cortical dysplasia, tuberous sclerosis, low-grade tumors, hypothalamic hamartomas, cavernous malformations. Surgery is very effective for controlling seizures. So why would you consider a stereotactic ablative approach if you have something that works very, very well? So it has to do with the fact that epilepsy control itself is not the whole story, right? So quality of life has a lot to do with not only seizure freedom, but making sure that patients are free of deficits. Um, if you take a 30-year-old patient and you make them free of seizures, but for the rest of their life they have a deficit that still keeps them from going back to work or doing something else, 10 years from now they won't remember the seizures, but they will remember the fact that they, they can't hold down a job or do certain types of things. So you always have to consider what are the potential deficits that could be incurred from this surgery. Now, granted, most of our open epilepsy surgeries are quite safe and well standardized, but I submit to you that we don't always know what cognitive deficits we're causing because we don't ask the right questions. And increasingly, it's recognized that some very subtle cognitive deficits that can be incurred by operating on the temporal lobe can have some long-term impacts. For instance, simply a one or two second delay in answering certain types of memory questions are strongly linked to patients never returning to work. So things that we might not easily pick up in our standard clinical assessments of cognitive deficits afterwards are things that actually have long-term consequences and impact on patients. And when we see these patients back in the clinic, hey, how are you doing? Have any seizures? Doing okay? This is not the sort of stuff that we pick up. So uh, increasingly, the, the uh, neuropsychologists are finding new and creative ways of assessing, and we're actually just starting to understand some of the functions of the temporal lobe and where they're actually located. So I, I submit to you that we don't always know what deficits we're causing. So this is just something that we have to consider going forward. So the pros and cons. Large resection, obviously you have a much higher chance of seizure freedom because you're more likely to get that whole epileptic zone in the classical way of thinking this or the ep disrupt that epileptic network in a more... Uh, a modern way of thinking of this. But the con is that you might get a deficit, um, whether or not you recognize it or not. Smaller resections, you might get no deficit or reduce your risk of deficit, but then you increase the chance of persistent seizures and multiple interventions. You don't do the patient's any favors if you don't make them seizure-free. That still is the most important thing, because people who are having seizures are having neurocognitive deficits no matter what, because their brain is getting electrocuted. But nevertheless, there's a paradigm shift, um, not just in epilepsy surgery, but neurosurgery in general. Paradigm shift of smaller resection or minimally invasive approaches, and this is based in part on technology and better targeting. So we're better able to define the minimal volume of tissue that must be resected or disconnected in order to isolate or remove the epileptogenic zone or network in the way that we're tending to think about this more and more. And smaller resection is not necessarily synonymous with incomplete or insufficient resection, but rather a better targeted and hence complete resection. 
it's not necessarily that bigger is always better and smaller is always worse. It's that just right is better. So evolution toward using progressively sophisticated non-invasive imaging is helping to delineate, uh, delineate and demonstrate the epileptogenic region. ICTL SPECT, uh, co-registered with MRI, MEG, PET, high-density EEG, frameless navigation, improvements in intracranial monitoring. These are all things that are helping us to better delineate the epileptogenic zone. So again, we've had an evolution of our mesial temporal resections towards smaller resection. So this is what we were doing in, in that 2001 Weeb study from New England Journal that was giving us 64% seizure freedom. So why were we evolving to uh, a, a smaller uh, cortical resection and amygdala hippocampectomy and then eventually even the selective amygdala hippocampectomy for those that do those? Why were we doing that? Because we felt that we were getting nearly similar seizure benefits in appropriate selected patients and yet there's the idea that perhaps we're getting improved at neurocognitive outcome. And I put a question mark there because even though we think that this is giving us a better neurocognitive outcome, we haven't completely demonstrated that yet. So a recent meta-analysis of anterior temporal lobectomy, a more aggressive resection, versus a selective amygdala hippocampectomy, a supposedly more tailored resection, shows that your chances for seizure outcome are not that different. Um, so Overall, in a large meta-analysis, 67% of patients were Engel class 1 after a selective, whereas 73% were uh, seizure-free after an ATL. So that means you need to do 13 selectives before somebody fails that would have benefited from that ATL. So if you could do less and get a very similar seizure outcome, you're going to start with less, right? That makes sense. But if you could figure out which patient needs that ATL or needs that larger resection, and you know that that's necessary, you may start with that. But that's the key question, knowing who's going to benefit uh, and who's going to have deficits. And then there's the other question of the, the smaller you get, maybe you have a decreased length of stay and so forth, other, other factors. So we just had a, a beautiful anatomical lecture about the temporal stem and all these structures. And you know, if you have a GBM, you're going to, it's okay. You're going to want to go through those areas because you're think, your outcomes are something you're measuring in months to years. Um, in terms of lifespan. If you're talking about an epilepsy patient and they come in with seizures, you want to get rid of the seizures and do nothing else to that patient if you can. Um, so the idea of disrupting the temporal stem actually has cognitive consequences. So the, the more we can get away from that, the better. And this is why the literature is full of all the different approaches to doing a selective amygdala hippocampectomy. Each of them is touted. You know, there's a classic trans-middle temporal approach. There's a, uh, a, a more um, trans- uh, uh, collateral sulcus approach. There's the subtemporal approach. There's the transylvian approach. I submit to you that each of these, uh, with the exception of ones that really do an OZ approach and come sub, come sub frontal, almost all these approaches are going to be very disruptive or either retract the temporal stem or actually transect the temporal stem. The transylvian um, done through a temporal approach is actually one of the most disruptive. As you saw uh, in the last couple lectures, you can get to the amygdala through a a, quote, trans-temporal, trans-sylvian approach, but you cannot get to the extent of the hippocampus without really coming under the frontal lobe, in, in which case you need to do more of an OZ. So the point is, these approaches can be disruptive, perhaps not in you know the most skilled hands, but in most surgeons' hands, these approaches have the potential of being very disruptive for the temporal lobe, even if all you take out is this. So what's the point of just getting the fly if you've destroyed you know the living room in the process you know I, I use an analogy with my uh, with my patients of having a classroom full of kids everyone's doing their assignments you've got one kid in the back of the room who gets up on a table every few minutes and screams at the top of lungs and, and throws things around the rest of that classroom is not going to be very effective until you take care of that one kid and the way we used to take care of that kid was you threw a hand grenade in the classroom and you know what you take care of the problem but what's the collateral damage so can we take that one kid out, put him in detention, and, and everyone else gets a better grade? So the goals of stereotactic ablative procedures in epilepsy, minimize adverse effects, surgical and cognitive, and decrease healthcare utilization, length of stay, complications. Um, I'm going to, so laser interstitial thermal therapy is basically the, the most modern version of this. And this is basically the use of lasers to create a thermal uh, lesion in the brain. But what has really allowed this to become uh, much more useful in the past couple of years is the merging of this technology with, the, with um, the use of MR thermography, being able to do real-time targeting and actually measure temperature of the brain and see your ablation in real time, the extent of it, and knowing when to quit. 
Um, and also the fact that the fibers used to deliver this thermal therapy have improved, improved to the point they're now cooled. You can control your temperature so you don't overheat. Um, and improvements in stereotactic targeting in general. So the idea here is not, you know, you may think laser and, a, and thermal therapy, and for those of you familiar with radio frequency ablation, you're used to this. Oh, in order to destroy tissue, you have to boil it, right? You just want to boil it in a very small area, above 100 degrees Celsius. But that's not actually what we're trying to do with thermal therapy. What we really want to do is work in this area. From 44 to 59 degrees Celsius, temperature uh, the damage to the tissue is very time dependent. If you ever burn your hand with hot water, what do you, what do you immediately do? What do you do if you get, get hot water in your hand? You run under cold water. Why? Because it's temperature and time dependent. You've heated up the tissue, and the longer it sits at that temperature, the, the more damage is being done. So you run under cold water to try to, to stop that damage. So if you raise the tissue temperature even just above 45 degrees and leave it there for a few minutes, you're actually creating thermal damage. And these are much lower temperatures than what we're talking about boiling, where you would vaporize tissue, cause gas, uh, uneven heat spread, and so forth. This is the danger zone. So as long as we're heating somewhere in this range, we can safely and predictably produce ablations. So this is uh, one uh, technology that's used, Visualase, that I, I mostly use. Um, there's also the Neuroblade system I'll show you as well. Uh, we have this station here today. You'll be able to see this hands-on, see how the station works. You'll see some of the devices that are used for this. This is basically a cooling ca cannula with a fiber optic probe that delivers uh, laser energy and a diffusing tip, which then basically just shoots light out into the tissue, hits the tissue, and delivers energy. And so this can be delivered uh, with a stereotactic stylet and then you replace the fiber optic probe and that allows you to to put this where you want and do a thermal ablation. So stereotactically implantable opt optical fiber for delivery of laser energy. This particular system is a 15 watt 980 uh, nanometer diode laser. Um, terminates in this 10 millimeter diffusing tip. There's also a 2 millimeter diffusing tip option for really small ablations. Um, and it's enclosed in this internally irrigating polycarbonate cooling catheter and allows you to do real-time MR thermometry, so this is a phase contrast imaging, and irreversible damage zone prediction. So this, this workstation is a slave to the MRI, so as the MRI is running, it's taking that data and running the algorithms that help you to predict where the damage zone is and when to be done. So this is the fiber again. This is the stereotactic rod that is used to put it in place. This is a, a stereotactic bolt. Um, so you drill a stereotactic hole in the skull, put in this bolt, and then feed this through that. So here's a patient, the very first, um, one of my very first patients that I did, that she had a, um, uh, that uh, cingulate, uh, cingulate pole uh, that uh, we were hearing about in the, the previous lecture. She had an uh, epileptic focus there that we had demonstrated with depth electrodes. And, and I, you, because these are very minimal incisions, you can actually go right through the forehead. So we did ablations uh, in that location. So this is one way to do it, and we did this with a frame, and you'll see how to do that today. You can also do this with frameless stereotactic systems. And then we also routinely use the clear point system, which is a system designed for DBS, but we, we've adapted for doing MRI interventional ablations. Um, this is a competing technology by another company uh, called Monteris. They make the Neuroblate thermal therapy system. It's a, a very similar type of system. It's a, it's a slightly bigger probe, slightly more complicated. They tout the ability to do sort of a side fire uh, laser so you can direct the thermal therapy. There's questions as to how different that really is, uh, but it's just, this is another version of this, and this is their own uh, frame that they use, that this is use, use uh, frameless navigation. But increasingly, both the Visual Ace system and the Monterey system can be used with any number of stereotactic platforms. So whatever your stereotactics of choice is, you can use these systems. Um, I don't want to belabor this. These have, these have slight differences, and um, some of them are theoretical, some of them are practical, but the point is there's two station, there are two different types of systems that people are using, and if, if you want to talk about more about that later, about what the advantages and disadvantages of each are, we can. For the most part, the Visual A system uh, and the Monterey system were designed and came in the market about the same time. The Visual A system really caught on with epilepsy, whereas the Neuroblate system was mostly being used for tumors. So uh, Visual A has been used, I think, something going on 2,000 times in the United States, about half those cases for tumors, half those cases for epilepsy. And last I checked with Neuroblate, there was something like 400 cases in the United States, mostly tumor, very few epilepsy, but they're catching up on the epilepsy front. So. Any stereotactic method you use can be used to put these things in place. Uh, Brain Lab Vario Guide, and you can see it very well for those who use that. The Medtronic Precision Aiming Device, we have that for you to play with today. 
That's or some people call it the robot arm. It's basically just a stereotactic outlining arm that you can then drill through. Same thing with the Vario guide on the Brain Lab. It's a very similar concept. You can use frames like the Lexel or CRW. You can navigate uh, some people who have cannulated drills with navigation. Uh, Freehanding these with stereotaxis. I wouldn't recommend doing that, but some people do that. I think this is highly inaccurate. Uh, and then, of course, um, the Clearpoint uh, MRI targeting system that, that I make a lot of use of at Emory. So the surgical workflow for stereotactic laser thermal amygdala hippocampotomy, which is our workhorse application. We do a lot of mesial temporal ablations with this. So it's a transoccipital approach uh, to the mesial temporal structures going through the body and head of the hippocampus and terminating in the amygdala. Um, we, when we first started, we were mostly doing it with the CRW frame, although we've gone to the clear point system. There's the stereotactic bolt in place with a fiber in it. Um, there's another picture of that coming from an occipital approach. Again, here's a, uh, a fiber in place in the mesial temporal structures. And so this is a snapshot from, or a screenshot from the workstation that actually shows the phase mapping that shows you the temperature difference when you're doing your ablation. And so the different temperatures, so this is this red is, is, is an area that's 55 degrees or above. That little yellow rim is 45 degrees or above. And out here is 38 degrees or above. And remember what I told you is 45 degrees and above will cause ablation in a time-dependent matter. Things closer to 60 and above will have instant denaturation. So you can use this thermal mapping. And then the, uh, the software is actually creating running algorithms that tell you what's the tissue that's actually going to be dead. So it, it's, a, it's a map of this over time and, and keeping track of all the pixels that are ablating. And you can, you can actually track this in a couple different planes. This is a coronal, but you could track it in uh, multiple planes. So this is a, a, um, this is a sped up view of a three minute ablation. So again, the, the phase mapping and then showing the actual map of what is actually getting ablated in an anterior head of the hippocampus. So I told you it's a 10 millimeter diffusing tip so that you can actually pull the fiber optic back and forth in the cannula so you can ablate along anywhere along that track. So this is the first ablation along that track and then we pull it back and then you can see development of our second ablation just behind it. So what you end up with is a confluent ablation of the mesial temporal structures. In this case, focus on the amygdala and hippocampus, but you can make wider ablations if you want. So this is an example then, first ablation, confluent ablations, and then you can run T1 post contrast, you can diffusion imaging, flare imaging, T2 imaging, post contrast, T1, all these can show you an acute lesion. So here's T2, here's DWI, here's the T1 post contrast, you can see a, a rim enhancing lesion here, here is in a sagittal, um, and uh, again in the coronal. So, not only can you see in real time the prediction, but then you can run your anatomical images to see did you actually create the ablation you wanted to. And the point here is that what's estimated as being dead is very, very close to the actual uh, uh, image that you see when you run your T1 post contrast MRI. So a typical workflow um, using a frame uh, would be like uh, head, head frame placement, um, imaging with fiducials and trajectory plan. Um, and then you go from the diagnostic MRI, you, you get your imaging, and whether you do that pre-op or intra-op, you have to go from the MRI suite to the operating room where you then do your, uh, your steps to actually put the stereotactic device in place, and then you go back to the MRI to do your probe localiz localization to verify your targeting, then you do your ablation, post-procedure imaging to verify you, you're done. Um, if you want to do multiple trajectories, you could do that in the operating room before going, but that assumes you have to plan ahead to know maybe you're doing multiple met metastases or you're doing a very complex lesion that you need to do multiple probes through. So this is a, a typical workflow. You can see the obvious disadvantage of this is that you have to go back and forth between the MRI and the operating room. So that's why we at, at Emory have, have really been using the ClearPoint system. So we do the whole thing in a diagnostic MRI suite. Everything's real-time imaging. You verify in real time your targeting. You see what your ablation is. And if you decide then and there you need to come at it from another trajectory, you can do that. So um, this, this is actually a case I did yesterday. So this is just an example of an amygdala hippocampectomy. So you see the patient positioned in pins. This is a flexible head coil on the MRI scan. I've, I've shaved in the area that I, I know is going to be approximately the region where I'm going to start. And I usually start about five centimeters above the Indian and four to five centimeters over laterally. That's just my starting point. And then I give myself room. So I, this is with no pre-planning. It's relatively standardized for that particular approach. Um, and then you, this is a fiducial grid. Uh, this shows up on the MRI scan. It's, it's a little grid of A, B, C, D, E, F, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's just a grid that allows you to, once you've created an entry point, to be able to mark that on the scalp. You'll be able to see that when you, when you get next door in the, the stations later today. Um, and then you get your volumetric imaging. 
Um, and then you create a plan. You can start with your target in the head of the hippocampus, and you can create a trajectory that's somewhere along that grid, and that allows you to then keep track of where your entry point is relative to that grid. Say it's maybe, you know, box B3 um, or something like that, and you can see where that is, and that's going to be where you're going to mount your frame. And just like uh, a navigation system on Brain Lab or uh, Stealth, you can, you can modify this and it reconstructs uh, along your trajectories. You'll be able to play with this workstation next door and, and see what it feels like. And then the other thing is the software recognizes the grid. And then, so you can see it's recognizing this and then it's, it tells you where this projects out onto the scalp. So my entry point is right there. And so that tells me where to mark the scalp and actually put the uh, MRI guidance frame on. So um, once you do that, put that frame on, this is what it looks like. Uh, it's a frame and these, these four dials here are, allows you to change X, Y, so there's a platform so you can make it find adjustments in X and Y and a pitch and a roll. So it's like a miniature version of a CRW frame that allows you just a very confined space, that same sort of stereotaxis. And then um, you, you run sequential uh, brief scans that and it makes recommendations of how to change X, Y, pitch and roll until your cannula is perfectly aligned with your desired trajectory. And so what you can barely see here is a little uh, X, a little X marks the spot overlapping with where it's actually pointing. Um, and so this, I don't, you can't see this probably, but the, it's showing here an error of 0 0.3 millimeter 2D radial. So that's a 0 0.3 millimeter radial error in the X and Y. So it tells you also it's, it's off by 0.3 millimeters in the X and 0.1 millimeters in the Y. So you can get quite accurate with this in the prediction. Then you do a stereotactic twist drill in the MRI just because we don't have an MRI compatible um, air drill um, that we would use for this, but the other point of this is this is percutaneous, so you make a stab incision and just a twist hole. Truly stereotactic procedure. Um, this is an example then, uh, then you can put a, um, a ceramic stylet partially in and see is it actually going where you expect it to? So you don't have to put it all the way to target and then find out you were wrong. You could in, put it in part way and then project. So here's a projection, you can see our stereotactic stylet and then you can follow a line down to your target and it'll tell you this is within, uh, you can't see it because it's blurry here, but 1.4 millimeter 2D radial error. So that's close enough for a stereotactic procedure when I'm going to do an ablation. So I can see it's going to go where I want it to, and then I can finish inserting the device. So this is a frame with a laser device inserted into the back of the head from this case yesterday. So what are our outcomes? Um, we've published some of our early work, but this is more recent work. Uh, so our 12-month follow-up on our first 26 patients for, uh, for uh, middle temporal lobe epilepsy. Pathology apparently matters quite a bit. For the patients with uh, preoperative MTS on the MRI, they're 65% seizure-free after just this procedure alone. But patients that are either MRI normal or have, don't quite have MTS, their chances of seizure freedom with this procedure alone are much lower, which is interesting. But um, that does make some sense that perhaps their seizure networks are more widespread. Increasingly, we can bring these patients back and do wider ablations. And so far in our first five patients, bringing these patients back does result in seizure freedom. But we don't have enough long-term uh, outcome on that yet to just see how they do. But the point is, for a well-selected patient population, this is on the same order as what you get with a selective amygdala hippocampectomy. Um, better neurocognitive results as well. So this is just an example of, the, uh, of a... Of a a traditional uh, neurocognitive test, um, the Boston naming test here in, in dominant temporal lobes. So these are a bunch of individual patients who've had open resections, either anterior temporal lobectomy or a, a selective amygdala hippocampectomy. Half these patients are from memory, half of them are from University of Washington, uh, who we collaborate with. And so you can see all these patients, if you measure, have deficits. Okay, Some of them are significant, some of them are not, but they're all to almost to one patient showing deficits that are measurable in the Boston naming task on, on the dominant side. But you compare that to uh, the patients with left-sided uh, laser ablation, their deficits are much lower or actually they improve. So this is suggesting that you can have improved neurocognitive uh, outcomes. And some, with, some of our more non-traditional tasks, this is a famous face naming. Um, we actually think that famous face naming is coming more from the fusiform gyrus, and yet when you go to uh, take out the amygdala and hippocampus through an open approach, you usually are transecting the temporal stem. And so probably you're disconnecting part of that, which is why these open patients are having so many deficits, even though we don't resect those areas. We're disrupting the communications of the temporal lobe. But the patients with the, with the laser ablation are not having as much of a deficit.
Likewise, uh, famous face recognition. So there's naming versus recognition, same sort of story. Some patients have profound deficits, some don't when you do an open approach, but our laser ablations have much less deficits. So this, um, and then what about memory? We're taking up the hippocampus, right? So memory should get worse. Um, this is very preliminary, um, and I stress perhaps we're not assessing memory correctly to recognize all of this, but in the open patients, uh, if we look for decline in any uh, memory measure on our open patients, almost all patients have some decline in their memory, whereas the laser ablation, this is stereotactic laser amygdala hippocampotomy, much less likely. In fact, this individual patient that did have a deficit was actually a bilateral epilepsy patient, so even he's kind of an exception. Uh, improvement in memory measures, so again, you throw that hand grenade in the classroom, everything goes down, but if you can just take out the kid with who's misbehaving, everybody else's performance in that class goes up. So this is why you do a temporal lobe procedure, and if you can get rid of the seizures, you can actually see global improvements in IQ if you don't do a lot of collateral damage in the, in the, on the way in. So for open patients, you may see improvements in some memory measures, but we see more, uh, more improvements in memory measures in the, in the laser ablation patients. So um, to summarize these outcomes, uh, uh, ATL, SAH, you get collateral damage from approach to mesial temporal lobe, whereas with a stereotactic approach, perhaps we can minimize collateral damage. Um, pain and adverse effects uh, related to a cranial, extracranial approach versus decreased pain. These patients have one stitch. Uh, they have very little pain. They go home the following day, as opposed to the hospitalization for a, a craniotomy. Uh, it's, a, it's a longer surgery. Um, a longer, it's often an ICU stay and longer stay in the hospital. Um, we, we literally did a left-sided patient on Friday. He was a pediatrician, and he went to work on Monday. So, I mean, it's, this, this, it's just amazing to see these patients just get up and walk out and wonder if they've even had surgery. Um, so our outcomes, again, what's stressed in the literature is outcomes up to 70% chance of seizure freedom, but often the literature doesn't really discriminate between the mesial temporal sclerosis and those MRI normal patients, the much more difficult patient population. Um, but... At least in the MTS population, we are seeing up to 65% chance of seizure freedom. Um, lit laser interstitial thermal therapy can be used for a broad range of other epileptic foci. Um, so I'm going to breeze through this quickly because I know I'm out of time. But temporal lobe epilepsy, um, it's been used extensively with hypothalamic hamartomas, focal cortical dysplasias, tuber sclerosis, DNET, periventricular heterotopias. Uh, we and others have used it for, uh, tried using it for corpus callosotomy. And recently at Emory, we've been doing a lot of corpus, or doing cavernous malformations. So um, uh, Angus Wilfong and, and Dan Curry at uh, Texas Children's have done the most of these hypothalamic hamartomas. They've pioneered that. Um, this, let's see. Uh, oops. Yep, so this just keeps going. Here, OK, so hypothalamic hamartoma. Um, this can also be paired with depth electrode uh, monitoring of patients. So this is an example of a patient of mine that had tuber sclerosis, had a, a remote resection in the frontal lobe, but was not seizure-free. We studied him with extensive depth electrodes. You can see this depth electrode right here is in the anterior insula, right here. And so then we did, we took out the depth electrode and I brought him back and did ablation in that area. And you can see these little red marks here, my safety markers, where I can define where I don't want temperature to go above 45 degrees without turning off the laser. And uh, ablations, very interestingly, tend to follow anatomical barriers. Um, so you can see this ablation coming up very nicely uh, and, and covering the insula and covering some of the more inferior um, temporal or frontal lobe that I wanted to get as well. So this, you can see cord, uh, corresponding to that anterior insular depth electrode and then uh, on the sagittal here as well, taking out uh, anterior insula. So these sorts of tailored ablations can be done with um, depth electrodes. This is an example of a... Uh, just one example of a cavernous malformation that we did. The other interesting thing about this approach, because you're only raising the tissue temperature to no higher than 85, 90 degrees, you should leave blood vessels pretty much alone because they have flow. They're able to take heat away. Same reason you put your, you burn your hand and you put it under cold water. Well, if you've got flow in that area, it actually takes the heat away. So here's an example of a cavernous malformation. And anyone, I mean, this is the vein of LeBay right here. Corpus callus, uh, the, um, the cameras malformation is sitting right next to the vein of lit. Here's our thermal map, and you actually the ablation. You can see it's sort of leaving out a little hole there where the vein of LeBay is. Here's our immediate uh, post-ablation imaging. And here's six, six months later, and this is the cavernous malformation, this shrunken little thing here. And the vein of LeBay is just fine, and this patient has been seizure-free for a year. Um, increasingly, this is used for neuro-oncology, uh, recurrent gliomas, recurrent um, metastases, especially radiation failures.
this is showing a lot of promise for that. I'm running out of time, so I won't delve into it, but um, even your spine practice is not safe. This is work being done at MD Anderson, where they're using this for, um, for um, compression of the spinal cord, and they, uh, with immediate treatment with laser ablation followed by radiation therapy, they can avoid having to do separation surgery, and patients go home the following day. And also, it seems to really improve their pain. Um, again, the, the work there is very preliminary, but they presented, I think, their first 10 patients at the last uh, CNS meeting. So in conclusion, uh, laser interstitial thermal therapy is a promising minimally invasive approach for temporal lobe epilepsy and probably other types of epilepsy. It's probably not as effective as a wider resection, but yes, we don't want to take out the entire temporal lobe with a hand grenade. We want to do what's just right. And the other nice thing about this approach is it doesn't burn bridges. You start smaller, it helps most people if they're appropriately selected, but you can always do more. And the patients are up for that uh, because they'd much rather have a minimally invasive approach. Uh, potentially improved neurocognitive impacts, especially in the dominant hemisphere. Um, this can be followed by an open resection or other ablations if need be, um, and it may be effective for other lesional epileptic foci, uh, decreased morbidity, increased tolerability. Uh, there's an increasing role in neuro-oncology that's being defined, and uh, st we're still looking at the improved healthcare economics of this. Um, uh, obviously, we're minimizing patient discomfort and recovery time. And of course, there's nothing like having a minimal incision. So um, with that, I apologize for going over, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yes.